this is going to my computer and we have begun recording. Okay, thank you. Uh, Boza Rivers? Uh, Boza Rivers, Chairman of the Harlem Arts Alliance, in addition to being the uh, Chairman of the Arts and Culture Committee for the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce. We're so pleased that both of those organizations, in addition to the North Manhattan Arts Alliance, is joined in with our great borough president, Ms. Gail Brewer, to address some of the issues just facing the local arts and culture, mid-sized to small arts organizations, individual artists, uh, visual performing museums and libraries, just so that we can get a sense of what's happening in communities of color throughout the city. So this call allows us to do that. I'd like to, at this point, uh, turn this over to a statement of purpose from our borough president, Skill Brewer. Hold on a second, Gail. Let me unmute you. Okay. Gail, start again. Thank you. So I am Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I want to thank Boza Rivers for bringing us all together. I want to thank Athena Moore, who's the director of our Northern Manhattan office. And I certainly want to thank Noah Hidalgo for making this possible. Um, all the community boards also have this wonderful Zoom function. We're the first borough to do that, much thanks to Noel. So on many fronts, thank you, everybody. Now, in terms of the arts community, which is not just arts, it's all about the economy of our city. Without the arts organizations, our economy does not thrive. And of course, we, when we get back, that's something that we need to think about. So I spent some time on the phone today because I think I want to just talk about how we get resources. Um, and as you know, it's very dire, but there are two places, one of which, of course, is the New York Community Trust, which is being funded by Ford and Bloomberg and other organizations. It's got around $75 million. It's also funding the human services, so it's not all for the arts. But, um, and there's a $250,000 limit as to what you will get. I'm just gonna go through some of the resources and then, uh, I mean, later on we'll have more discussion. The second, of course, and that's a grant. The second is the Nonprofit Finance Fund, which is a loan. Those two organizations are working together. I think they're both Ford and Bloomberg, but we wanna be clear that uh, all of the organizations on this call should at least apply for sure. My understanding from talking to the Bloomberg Philanthropies this morning is that they will be getting more money into these two funds, but as I said, we're also sharing them with the human services sector. Uh, the other issue in terms of local I wanna mention is I am really livid that the city of New York, the mayor's office, and we've gotten a lot of calls to this effect, is talking about pegs for the cultural sector. Um, uh, we feel very strongly that that should not be happening and we are going to be fighting. The economy is based on the, in many cases, on the art sector in the city. So just so you know, uh, we are gonna be fighting that with every possible measure. In terms of the federal, and I did see that our wonderful Congressman Espriot is on this call, so later on you might wanna ask him for much more information. But in talking to the Department of Cultural Affairs also this morning, we know that there is funding for the arts organizations as well as business, small business, from the federal both CARES Act and the Paycheck Act. And um, it's complicated. You're competing obviously with the for-profit sector. Um, but we know that the Department of Cultural Affairs on the city level, either today or first thing tomorrow morning on their website, they are going to have opportunities from, the, from volunteer attorneys. And also there's something uh, that's gonna be posted from the New York State uh, Arts Council to talk about how the arts sector can help access the federal money. Um, the federal money uh, is open to both small and large. The ones that I mentioned earlier, the New York Community Trust and the Nonprofit Finance Board are for those of 20 million or less, which I assume is most of those on this call. 
And the good news is it doesn't include uh, government money. So it would be no matter, probably almost everybody would qualify for the two uh, private sector philanthropy. Uh, and on the final, I just want to say uh, we will work really, really hard with this sector, uh, with the Northern Manhattan Arts Organizations, which are so much the backbone. There may be other uh, support mechanisms. I have not been in touch with Lower Manhattan uh, Cultural Council, nor have I been in touch with the Empowerment Zone. So there may be other possibilities, but I just want to mention those are the ones uh, that we're mentioning. And of course, the federal money is for those that stimulate the economy. And goodness knows everybody on this call, because of what you do, you stimulate the economy. So that's the beginning, and we can talk more. Noel, thank you very much to everybody who made this possible. Okay, Boza, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm unmuting again. Okay. Hold on a second. Uh, we here. can't hear you. Okay. Let let's uh there we are. Got it. Boza, My... you are unmuted. I got it. Uh, Joyous Pierce from the Harlem Arts Alliance. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So thank you uh, to the Manhattan Borough President for getting the ball rolling right away by sharing those resources. Uh, that's exactly what we're here to do. Um, I'm Joyce Pierce. I'm the Executive Director of the Harlem Arts Alliance. Um, and firstly, I just wanted to extend my, my gratitude for all of you for being here today. Um, we at HAA are trusting and believing that in this time of so much uncertainty that all is well with each of you um, and your loved ones. Um, and HAA is here to be a sounding board and a location for the centralization of resources um, in this time of immediacy. So today we're here to definitely report out uh, regarding the statuses of arts and culture organizations. Um, but we also hope that this conversation will be an opportunity to uplift and express uh, the continued buildable compassion that we have in our community towards community collaboration and relationships that will benefit our community in the long run um, in this time of immediacy. Um, and thank you all for being present in this moment. There will be an opportunity to um, ask questions and share questions with the guest speakers. So I really encourage you um, to send those questions in so this can be a dialogue uh, versus just a, a forward facing meeting because we're all uh, socially distanced right now. So it's really important that we try to connect as much as possible. Um, and I'm sending my virtual love and light to all of you um, and gratitude for being here today. So thank you all. Am I on now? Yes, we can hear you, Boza. Hi. The next is Neria Leva Gutierrez from the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. Hi, everybody. Um, it's such an honor to be here with all of you today. Um, I think well, we can all uh, see how strong um, and how important um, we all are, um, and especially at a moment like this. Um, I'm the acting executive director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, also known as NOMA. Um, we have been working with artists and arts organizations in Northern Manhattan since 2007, um, promoting their work, cultivating um, their work, and, and supporting in general. Um, we uh, have hosted um, annually an arts stroll that takes place every um, May and June that serves over 60,000 um, New Yorkers. And this year, obviously, um, we've had to postpone um, our stroll, but we have really been working and we are committed to continue to work um, with partners um, in collaboration with artists um, and to move all of our programming online. Um, and we've had some recent success, um, as recent as Tuesday night, 
um, we hosted for the first time an artist talk in conjunction with the Women of the Heights exhibition. We had over 40 artists participating. Um, we had someone even participating from Australia. Um, and so it was a very exciting, inspiring, uplifting um, uh, moment for us. Um, it was a forum to talk about how the arts can be such a powerful force um, and how it can really work toward um, bridging communities and bringing people together. Um, and that's what we're here to do. And so um, I'm honored to be among all of you today. And I look forward to continuing uh, dialoguing and collaborating and figuring out how we can all work together um, to make this world a, a little bit better. Thank you. Walker Kuhn, Paula Martin-Lyne's board member, professor of arts and culture at NYU and Columbia University. Yes, you can hear me now, yes? Yes. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And, and again, I extend my appreciation to you for joining in on this important call. Um, as Rosa mentioned, I am a founding board member of the Harlem Arts Alliance, uh, president of Walker International Communications Group, uh, and also an adjunct professor at Columbia University and NYU. Um, I also write a weekly blog, Arts and Culture Connection, and of course, my um, first book, Invitation to the Party. Uh, I just uh, finished writing the sequel to that, Champions for the Arts. So hopefully it'll be published in a year or so. Uh, but I wanted to begin this next section of our call with some brief remarks from a blog post that I recently wrote. Um, like many of you, you know, I've been saddened by the postponements of openings and cancellations of performances and closing the venues due to the necessary concerns about the public health consequences of transmitting COVID-19. I've been especially concerned about the artists, production crews, staff, and venue operators deeply impacted by the recommended social distancing needed to protect people from the virus. And at this point, the financial repercussions are unfathomable. Throughout history, in the midst of a crisis, it's been artists and their work that have been on the front lines as beacons of light through the darkness. And today, as we grapple with the global pandemic of COVID-19, champions of the arts are again modeling hopefulness and demonstrating creative ways to preserve and to persev persevere. Once again, pioneering a new and likely better age. So from virtual concerts to virtual tours, artists and cultural institutions are taking to cyberspace to keep the arts alive. I love the live stream offering by music and theater organizations as well as dance. And the truth is we can adapt when we must. Technological advancements have made it more accessible than ever before. Conferences have now switched to webinars and theater organizations um, as well. Um, and online classes are now being utilized by schools and academia. It's also encouraging to learn about nationwide emergency grants and resources, as we just heard earlier, which will help relieve some of the financial stress experienced by artists who have a sudden loss of income and may take years to recover. But one thing I know for sure, champions of the arts will continue to create, evolve, and seek opportunities to present works that hold up the mirror of truth so we can see ourselves. I believe this is our time to become pioneers of a better age. British historian Arnold Toynbee said that those living in an age of crisis must become pioneers of a better age, striving to find positive solutions and thereby turning the age into one of achievement. So this is the time, this is our time to advance with optimism and unity. Well, now I'm pleased to present a group of dynamic and eminent leaders who are integral to the cultural landscape of New York and the arts and cultural community. So as was mentioned earlier, please feel free to send questions um, to our esteemed speakers as they uh, begin to proceed. Our first speaker is Robin Bell Stevens of Jazzmobile. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And again, thank you, Donna, for the introduction and Gail and both of, for bringing us all together. So you see the three questions that we've all been asked. I believe that was on the agenda. But if not, I will start with the first one, which is explain what the negative impact of COVID has been on Jazzmobile. Answering this question, I know I'm seeing to the choir, and I suspect that my number one is probably the same as yours. 
which is delayed government grant payments. Um, I know that, thank you again, Gail, for what you shared. But in addressing this, we're doing what a number of other organizations are doing. We're getting on, <clears throat> excuse my analogy. We're getting on calls like this, and we're also working to see how we can share the information, keeping everybody engaged so that we can all work together as a team. But one message that I see that keeps popping up with all these different calls I've been getting on is that what we need to do is to continue to advocate individually, collectively, and the net result is that we will put a face on our pain because pain is something that I think needs to be underscored in terms of communicating to our donors and to others to let them know that we understand what needs to be done, but we need to drill down and have a full understanding of what that's doing to all of us. And of course, like everyone else, we are applying for grants and loans. Another impact, we have released performing artists and clinicians. Programmatically, this is Jazz Mobiles. The subject is jazz education season. So we're presenting our Saturday jazz workshops and jazz in the first person lecture demonstrations in New York City public schools, in the Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, and Staten Island. And I should have said, we should be presenting. We also have a city council funded program for senior centers through CASA. And we had to release all dates in the senior centers and they were scheduled to be in Manhattan and the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So including all education programs, the individual clinicians for private and semi-private lessons for students, small, mid-size, and large orchestras, 113 artists are impacted from that program alone. Wow. Last July, we launched a very successful Minton's Playhouse residency that was designed to provide more performance opportunities for our artists, introduce emerging artists, and to use it as a soft launch of a plan to present programming in clubs year-round. Those of you who know Jazzmobile were best known for our summer season of Summerfest. So for the residency program, we have released all artists for this program, impacting about 22 artists a month. On the fundraising side, in addition to the previously referenced impact of having to, how do we manage not getting the grants yet? We have also had to delay our community concert, Keep the Music Playing. Mm -hmm. And it's held in partnership with First Corinthians Baptist Church presenting over 30 professional musicians and 22 of our Saturday Jazz Workshop students to an audience of over 800 supporters every year for over seven years. So while we are rescheduling that in the fall, we are losing that revenue in FY20. Mm -hmm. Other fundraising revenue generated programs are not happening to include the previously mentioned Mittens Playhouse Residency. When we launched it in July and it ran for about six months, it was free admission with the plan to add a cover charge to the relaunch series. series. Now, to keep our audiences engaged, which is a second question, throughout all of this, we continue to be directly in touch with our audiences and artists via constant contact messaging and other social media platforms. Starting this weekend, in addition to the COVID-19 information and program changes, we are sending additional relief information. And to create brighter moments until we get to a brighter day, we all start, we, I'm sorry, we will be starting to send video and audio links of some amazing Jazzmobile artist performances. And sadly, our messaging has included more notices of artists who have passed several due to complications from COVID-19. In response to our messages, our audience has been a mix with messages such as, when are you coming back? Glad you didn't post on keeping music playing. My group and I always look forward to this event. Thanks for keeping us informed. Oh no, not another one. So sad to lose so many great jazz artists. And this one, please tell us you're not canceling some of us. So all of these replies and voice messages lead us to believe that our community sees us as viable. So in closing, I know I've been singing to the choir and through the conversations, emails, text messages, and other forms of communication, one thing in particular that strikes me is the reminder that in 
our community of arts and culture, we are very kind to one another. So I say to you, please stay healthy, stay safe, and stay strong. The community needs each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Our next speaker will be Anna Glass, Dance Theater of Harlem. Thank you, Donna. Uh, thank you, Boza. Um, thank you, uh, Borough President, Madam Borough President, um, Gail Brewer. It's really an honor and a pleasure to join you all today. So um, just to share a bit about the, the impact that this has had on Dance Theater of Harlem, um, we were in the second half, the, the culminating uh, section of our 50th anniversary celebration. Um, the intention was that this was 50 forward. We were looking ahead um, at uh, what we would love to see the next 50 years of Dance Theater of Harlem to be. Um, we had planned uh, a significant season at New York City Center, which was canceled. Our gala was canceled. Uh, the entire touring season of um, DTH was also canceled which resulted in, uh, really in one day, a loss of about $1.3 million. Um, Dance Theater of Harlem is about a five and a half to $6 million organization. So a $1.3 million hit in one day was extremely significant for us. Um, we also have a school um, which has been closed. And um, what we are in conversation about right now is um, preparing in the event that we begin having conversations about refunds, um, refunding remaining portions of tuition to families, families who've also been hard hit, where this is discretionary income for them to be able to participate in uh, a program like DTH. Um, with that, however, we, um, and, and let me say this one more piece, and then I'll go back to the school. Um, we're looking at also our summer program being uh, shut down, um, that we're, we're at the very least expecting that enrollment will decline significantly. Our summer program begins in June and runs until uh, August. Um, with the, the potential loss of that is at least close to about six to $700,000. And that would be on top of the 1.3 we've already lost. Um, what we are looking at, however, is ways that we can uh, turn the content that we create um, onto this online platform. I think we're all looking at that um, and, and really also looking at it as an opportunity, frankly, um, that we recognize that while this is a um, very challenging and, and, and in many ways unique moment, I think it's also a sign of things to come in the future and that we have to be um, ready and, and able to operate on multiple platforms. And so we are in the process of um, recording uh, instructional videos um, for all ages up to our little ones 18 months old all the way up to 18 years old um, as well as uh, the adult training that we have been doing typically in our studios converting that into um, videos that are can be done in living rooms um, we're also uh, utilizing our, our archive and showcasing old archival footage of uh, Dance Theater of Harlem as well as recent um, footage of the organization. And then we're also looking at, you know, the other aspects that make Dance Theater of Harlem unique, um, our social justice work, um, our conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion, creating panel discussions that bring in black ballerinas from across the country, uh, bringing in um, professors who have areas of expertise in cultural competency. Um, we're looking at DTH from all angles, not just the performing aspects of what we do, but also these very um, important conversations that Dance Theater of Harlem has been a leader um, for the last 50 years in. Um, so this sort of brings me to our strategies for survival. Um, we have been doing alternating furloughs. We have not laid off any staff. It was very important to me that we try to hold our staff together as long as possible. Um, it was also very important to me that we do our best in not letting go what typically gets let go, the lowest man on the totem pole, our part-time workers. Um, we decided that we were all going to take the hit collectively. Uh, Virginia Johnson, myself, we have both donated our salaries back to DTH. And so when uh, right now I have 
many of my administrative staff on furlough. Um, this would be the week that I would be on furlough, but I have donated my salary back. Um, and and we're, we're doing that right now until we um, have the cash on hand to make sure we have significant cash on hand um, to uh, stabilize a bit more. Um, we are, for those folks who bought tickets to our events, we are asking them to consider making donations, donating the, the, the proceeds of that ticket back to DTH, which we have seen great success um, with respect to that. Um, and then the last thing that we're doing um, is that we have had conversations with our funders and we have asked restricted dollars that had been earmarked for programs to be given some flexibility. Um, we may still do those programs or we may still do those activities, but that we wanted to have the flexibility um, to be able to have more cash on hand to figure out our strategies moving forward. The Mellon Foundation has been very helpful in that, um, in allowing us to utilize um, funding that we had received from them um, to have some flexibility with that. Um, you know, we are knee deep right now in, um, as I'm sure many of us with the SBA loans. Um, one of the things that I have felt very strongly about, and this is, has been a strategy for us to be able to survive, is the sharing of information. Um, what I learned uh, this week, I had the opportunity to participate in a call um, for small businesses. My board chair was a part of a group um, that were made of small businesses across the country. And he allowed me, it was a Zoom call, but he put his phone up to the, the, the screen so I could listen in on this conversation. It was led by the CEO of a community bank in California. And, you know, we're, we might be thinking small businesses from the perspective of mom and pop shops. These are small businesses that were venture capitalists. Their mindset was terribly different from what I was understanding and recognizing that the nonprofit sector is in competition for these dollars with um, individuals that have greater connections to their bankers than we do, that they're more locked into these conversations around loans and, and working with the Small Business Administration in ways that we're just not. And my concern is that, um, particularly for our Harlem um, organizations, that we are not keyed into conversations that are happening at a much higher level than what we, where we're operating. Um, it shot, you know, listening in on that conversation, I learned more from that conversation that I had learned from any webinar, from any uh, email list that we have been receiving around SBA, um, and, and quickly picked up the phone and called some of my colleagues to say, guess what? We are behind the eight ball. And if I'm feeling, Dan Seed of Harlem, a 5.5 to $6 million institution is feeling behind the eight ball on this, I can only imagine what the organizations smaller than us are experiencing. And so I, I sort of express that as a concern um, that I think that there was a financial, there, there, there was a dropping of the ball in this conversation around SBA. Um, I don't want to see that happen in other conversations that we see coming down the road with respect to opportunities for nonprofit, the nonprofit sector, and for our Harlem institutions specifically. Um, there was an education, there was a, an understanding of process that we missed out on. Um, and, you know, I have been uh, knee deep uh, with my banker today, um, getting ourselves ready and in line. Uh, to participate in um, the in PPP, um, and we're ready. We're ready. But I, I thankfully listened to a conversation on Wednesday that alerted me that I had to be thinking about this in a very, very different way. Mm -hmm. So I, I just share that with all of us, that I hope that we um, use this moment, not only, as I said, as an opportunity for us to reframe our our. our thinking on how we operate, meaning for DTH, we are, we're looking at the various ways that we can move the work that we do to an online platform. We will always still be live. We will always still be in our studios and on stage, but this has opened up another opportunity for us 
to think about our work a little bit differently. And I think it is also important that we think about how we collectively, the Harlem community, the folks on this call, how are we working together differently moving forward such that we don't get left behind. Um, so that is just my two cents. Mm. Thank you, Anna. Wow. Okay, um, Kofi, are you on the line? I don't see you. Okay, then we'll go forward. Uh, Melody Capote from Caribbean Cultural Center. Thank you, Melody. He's here somewhere. Melody, where'd I'm you go? Looking, I'm looking for Melody here. She's here. I've seen that lovely face. Maybe the next page. Oh. That's strange. She was just here. Yeah. Um, I do have a message that the representative, uh, Esfayat, has to leave at four. Um, okay. Maybe we could call on the, the congressman while I look for Melody? Yes. Yes. That's Great. Mm -hmm. uh, let me, Congressman, you are off mute. Well, thank you all for uh, getting on this call. Uh, obviously, I need not tell you these are difficult times in uncharted waters. Uh, first, uh, stay home. You know, I've seen some uh, numbers uh, that show that uh, our zip codes are not doing well uh, with regards to uh, folks with COVID-19 uh, and uh, folks' uh, in inability or reluctantly to uh, abide by social distancing. I think that we need to get that message out there. You folks are, are good communicators. Uh, I'm worried about the state of affairs here in the in the 13th district, I seen a map and it shows that the numbers in Harlem, East Harlem and Northern Manhattan and the Bronx in particular as well, the part of the Bronx are not doing too well. So um, that first, and uh, I'm listening to all of you. I know that it, these are difficult times in terms of your organizations, but I, you're very creative and innovative. And I'm sure that uh, the arts community will, will uh, in many ways, uh, lead the way in showing us how to get through this and how to access uh, the resources that we need and be creative in doing so, so that we can overcome this storm. Uh, I heard of the comment from uh, the Dance Theater of Harlem and, and the SBA. I had, in fact, this morning we had a conversation, a, a team uh, meeting with my staff discussing uh, that particular issue, which is access to those uh, dollars. First, the grants. is $10 billion worth of grants, emergency grants. And then there is $350 billion for loans that could be forgiven if you uh, demonstrate that you kept your, your workforce. And so this is an opportunity to obviously uh, reach, bridge the gap and be able to take care of some of the expenses or pay rent or mortgages or keep your workforce moving forward or preparing for opening up when we get there. Uh, so I want to make sure that my office is an asset to that and that we could, uh, we'll be able to line up the, uh, also the banking institutions so that they can be open uh, for business with all of you, uh, big and small. Uh, it makes, to me, it's not productive to pass a bill that builds, that brings uh, $350 billion uh, to uh, small biz businesses and not for profits and then very few in the district that I represent get access to the dollar. So I think that's a great challenge, uh, one that I think we, we could overcome and I, and I look forward to working with all of you uh, towards that. And thank you for again um, um, being part of this. The arts community is an important part of the district. Uh, not only do you perform here, but many of you, if not most of you, also live here. So it's, it's an important and integral part of the district. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you, Boza, Gail, thank you for convening this, and all of the uh, uh, organizations uh, from across the districts in our park. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, do we have Melody back? 
I can't seem to find Melody. Okay, then um, let's proceed. Um, Adamola, are you here? You want to read the call? Yes. So we'll go to Shade, Shade Lipcott from the National Black Theater and Coalition of Theaters of Color. Hello. Hi all. Um, I want to just thank you, Donna, Voza, and always um, Madam uh, Borough President Gail Brewer for inviting us to come together. Because um, it's the coming together that really is powerful. I think that we're all in silos having conversations, feeling like we're in it alone. That's what some of this isolation does. And with the fast moving updates and the fast moving opportunities coming together to be able to share resources the way that Anna so eloquently said is important. And so I'm beyond grateful for this town hall today and being invited to share a little bit about the National Black Theater and what we the impact of COVID-19 has been on. Um, theaters in particular are being hit pretty hard because the very basis of our business is gathering. And mm -hmm. so this idea that um, for the well-being and the health of our city, which we beyond understand and take very seriously, um, the impact is devastating. And we were the first hit, right? Because we are spaces in which people gather. Um, and we will probably be um, some of the longest affected because what we're hearing from our constituency is they don't know when they will feel safe enough to gather back, even when self-quarantine and self-isolation is over, you know, this, I, this idea of us being in close quarters psychically and psychologically has um, played a big part in how people see the world and perceive the world and our businesses. And so that has been a very big challenge and hurdle for us to overcome. I would also say it's been a very big opportunity because a lot of the social service work that MBT continues to do is to hold space for people's mental wellness. And we do that in daily conversations on our um, social media channels, really just trying to be a place where people can find hope, messages of, um, of, uh, of empowerment, and also a place where we're listening and um, providing uh, vital resources. In terms of uh, the hit to our revenue, like um, all of my counterparts on the call, I mean, we had to cancel the rest of our season and this is the height of our season. So we had to uh, um, close early um, our production of Skin Folk, uh, which was a co-production with Bushwick Star. It was a New York Times critic pick, sold out shows. We've had to refund those tickets and we've had to, we've had to uh, close that show, which got extended early. Um, one of the biggest um, and the most supported uh, programs of MBT really has been over the last half century of service to our community has been our training programs and our pipelines to jobs, our pipelines to black artists having opportunities to share their um, incredible talent. Um, and so those are our residency programs. And so um, we had to cut um, one of our residency the programs. We're the only um, theater, very proudly in this our district, we're the only theater in the country that has a dedicated residency program for Black playwrights, directors, and producers with a commitment to produce their work. Most people have residency programs, but those dollars to invest in the mounting of the work and the talent does not exist. And so MBT is one of the only places in the country that does that. We have had to cut that program. Um, our workshop production of our current playwriting residency got cut. The second production got postponed. Um, and in addition, we have um, really leaned into, as people who know National Black Theater, we are community first. We are proud to be community theater. We say it's community with a capital C. And so we've leaned in, we have always leaned into our community. And so some of the programs that have been disrupted is a partnership with the Schomburg um, uh, where we had seven commissioning artists. Um, those commissions were put on hold, that programming was put on hold. We also have a robust partnership with the Apollo Theater. Um, we had to put on hold um, um, not only a, a co-production that we are working on, but the launch of their new uh, Victoria space in the uh, 
spring of next year that has all been delayed and those are all contracts that have been written and need to be paid out and there is no revenue for that. Um, in addition uh, to that, we have a development program with the Apollo Theater. We were developing a musical that was going to have its first development showing in May that also got canceled. And then there's a citywide um, um, uh, program that we created uh, with Park Avenue Armory, which is 100 Years, 100 Women, lest we not forget that this is an election year and it is the centennial of the 19th Amendment where women, most women, got the right to vote. So we have created a whole um, day of commissions and programming with 10 other organizations around the five boroughs that also got um, postponed. Um, and, and lastly, I would say it's also the 30th anniversary of the Disability Act. And so National Black Theater had partnered with Carnegie Hall and New York Public Library for the Performing Arts um, at Lincoln Center to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Disability Act where we've commissioned five uh, Black artists with disabilities to create incredible new pieces of work in respondence to this powerful anniversary. That too has gotten canceled. And um, what we're looking to do, as many of our colleagues have spoken to, is say we're not canceling these programs as we cannot gather and as um, you know, our commissioning dollars have um, disappeared literally overnight. What we are doing is turning them into online conversations because I think not only do we want to hear and engage our, our most valuable artists and, and hear their insight around the effects of COVID, but also their process by which they get through. There are really some, jewel, some wonderful jewels there. And so we are launching those conversations in extension to the programs that would have happened um, with us gathering. The hardest hit that MBT has really experienced is our facility. National Black Theater has been on the corner of 125th and 5th Avenue for almost 52 years, for 52 years. And as many of you know, we are, we are a community hug, hub and hug. Our entrepreneurial arts program is a space subsidy and space um, donation um, program. We really champion um, affordability for arts and culture. So we use our space to donate to other organizations, to rent to other organizations and incubate them. On March 16th with the emergency order, we had to close our doors and we had to close revenue streams for all of those organizations that use us, which also meant it dried up our all of our uh, earned revenue overnight. And we are trying to support those clients to see their way through COVID so that they have businesses and, and organizations to come back to where MBT is pledging free space. In addition, I will say we are proud Harlemites and we are proud citizens of New York. One of the things that we've been participating in um, is um, with this city, I just want to get the um, um, term right, but um, we have filled out the New York City Emergency Management Survey um, as we are very um, lucky to be able to have space to donate to the city. And I just want to say this on the call with some elected officials and with um, uh, Madam Borough President, our space is available for any kind of crisis um, um, uh, use that one would need. We can use it for storage, we can use it for meals, we can use it for whatever the city, if, this, if it comes to the city needing space to coordinate crisis management, please call on MBT. We filled out all of the surveys to say that our space is available and we have goods as well to donate. So I just wanna put that out there. And lastly, from the point of hope, um, I have to say this woman to my left, uh, which probably is not to my left, to everybody's left, um, people like Anna, people like Robin and Melody, we have been leaning on each other in ways that has inspired me every day. We have been sharing um, resources. I mean, just on this call, my bank hasn't gone live with the PPP loan and Anna's has taken pre things and we're just emailing each other. Is it live yet? Can I help? We've been sharing financial um, resources with each other and that part is beautiful and that part gives me so much hope for how we will get through this. But we absolutely need the leadership that we have on this call with you, um, Madam Borough President, because this FY20 funding that you are pushing for is the lifeline, are the ventilators 
for our organizations. We understand it's life and death out there, but these funds that have been promised and contracted and up until a week ago were told that are coming down the lines are the ventilators for our organizations. We have had to lay people off, furlough people, and uh, defer salaries. And we've made those hard choices and decisions based on the reality of what was in front of us, which was that our doors were closed and we had no revenue. And those decisions were also made by, you know, agencies telling us that we could count on them for what has already been allocated to us. And so without that, I have, I don't know how I make payroll. I don't know how the social safety net that is um, this that is our workers stays in a place where they can count on once they can't count on us for our word even if our word is this is going to be rough and this is what it's going to be but we promise you we will navigate it with you when we have to start backtracking it gets very scary and so I would say from that standpoint we're applying for all the loans we're applying for all the grants and we really need continued leadership as you've shown um, for a president around this FY20 money because it ha it is really our ventilators and the difference between our life and death of our organization. Thank you. Thank you, Shade. Our next uh, speaker is Clayton Banks from Silicon Harlem. Am I muted or can you hear me? We can hear you, Clayton. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for the borough president's support. Arts, I, I, I've been listening to the call and I feel so nice because I'm always on with techies and they're too rough. The art people are so nice. I love it. So I just have a couple of quick things to say that I hope will bring um, some momentum in this crisis. So first of all, what you want to do, I don't know if you need to see my video or not, I'm actually got my mask on and all that kind of good stuff, but basically one of the things that I realize is almost uh, about 80% of things that you do now inside, you can do virtually, right? Yeah. So when you have an artist in residence, for example, uh, technology online now is, is actually really good for that. You can do artists and residents over the internet. Some of you may already be doing that, but that's a, a great opportunity for you to bridge the gap of some of the income you're going to lose. I mean, when uh, COVID hit, it obviously hit some of your younger artists and upcoming artists the, the most because they all make modest income, modest incomes anyway. So this little hit is taking them all the way down. And I think there's been an initiative initiated um, around having artists buying each other's um, art and, and, and things that they make. So you might want to pledge yourself into that uh, movement, which is all online, where you can actually just, you know, sort of support each other. Uh, so that's available out there. But I would say that probably the main thing is take a look at your infrastructure, your technology, what you have, right now, how you get online, how you're connecting with people, and build um, that now, because even though I know it seems temporary, having a online approach to art and culture is something that will last much further than what this pandemic is going to do. So um, I'm available to help people on every single level. Uh, it's glad to see all the different types of people on this call. If you are looking for online audiences. I'm sure most of you are using a lot of the social media. There's also plenty of websites. There's also plenty of data out there that you can utilize to find your um, constituents and people that would be willing to support your effort. Um, and Silicon Harlem is here for you. All of our services are free right now for the next 60 days. After that, you got to pay us at least $5 an hour. But we are definitely here for you if you need some help with uh, setting up an infrastructure that will help you stay in business and um, you know anything I can do to be help a, a world without art is not a world so that's the way I look at it hmm. thank you Clayton I hope everyone takes advantage of that free offer it sounds great 
<laughs> okay, um, I'd like to go back to the uh, schedule. Uh, Kofi Boiteng is now on the call. You know, we have had a couple of technical glitches, so we're going to go back uh, to a couple of the speakers who couldn't get on before. But I'm going to ask speakers, you know, because we want to try to be respectful of everyone's time, uh, please try to limit your words to around four minutes uh, because we still have quite a bit more to cover in this call. So, Kofi, are you available? Yeah, I am here. You hear me? Yes. Thank you. Well, I have very, very little to say. Uh, WADC West Salem Development Corporation, as most of you know, has been awarding grants to nonprofits of which the art community has been extremely uh, a lion's share of that. And uh, we are maintaining the payments even through the, the closure. We are, if we are working from our homes and we are still working. So any arts organization or any organization for that matter that is due a grant from WADC through 2019 can expect payment. Uh, as I'm sitting here, that's exactly what I'm doing, processing those. So that should be comfort. Uh, of course, in addition to that, we put several things on our website, including summaries of the CARE Act. Very soon, we are going to dive into that to break it down and uh, hold some kind of a webinar for the grantees to help people navigate through how they can take advantage of uh, any kind of assistance. So that's what I have to say for now. Oh, thank you, Kofi Boiteng. Okay, um, Melody, I think you were able to call back in, yes? Uh, Donna, one second. Before Melody goes, I'm just going to interrupt just um, briefly. Sure. We'd like to have uh, Council Member Mark Levine to address us because he will have to leave. Sure. Mm -hmm. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry for the camera rotation. Um, well, thank you, Donna. Thank you, Athena. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rivers. And most of all, thank you to our borough president. Um, Gail has been amazing in this crisis. I mean, she's fighting for small businesses, for seniors, and what you're doing for cultural scale. Um, not enough of the city's talking about that. and. Um, so your leadership on that is just so impactful. Uh, I've been able to, to actually be on this Zoom uh, since you started, and, and I'm quite moved by the efforts you're all making in the face of this unprecedented and truly brutal crisis. Um, I, I think it may have hit the cultural sector as hard or harder than it's hit any other sector of the city. And you know, we're going to need you to come through this strong. We're going to need you and the work you do more than ever as we get through this crisis. We're going to need the kind of inspiration you provide, your ability to uplift people, to bring us together um, as New York City begins the healing process, begins to bounce back, tries to restart economically. Culturals are going to be more important than ever. And I want you to know that in the city council, I am screaming about this as we now turn our attention to passing our budget for uh, FY 2021. We still have to pass the budget by early June. Uh, that's actually in the city charter. And we're going to start doing hearings on the budget virtually and starting, I think, in the next week or two. Hasn't been scheduled yet. We'll let you know. Um, but uh, we're going to fight to preserve funding for nonprofits, for culturals, for community-based organizations, uh, because we know you've been hit hard, and because we do know that a lot of the larger pots of funding are targeting individuals and businesses over nonprofits, and um, it's going to be up to the city, I think, to focus resources on culturals and nonprofits. Uh, I, I do want to mention um, that, uh, forgive me if this has already been mentioned, that the emergency relief fund that New York Presbyterian has established together with the Hispanic Federation uh, is launching now with $2 million in relief 
immediately and eight million over the coming two years. That nonprofits, including culturals, are eligible to apply. And I'm just going to read out the uh, web page for that um, because you might not know about it. So it's very simple. It's just hispanicfederation.org slash NOMA fund. NOMA as in Northern Manhattan. That's just N O M A fund, F U N D. Um, so again, hispanicfederation.org, NOMA fund. This is for both uh, for profit and nonprofit organizations uptown. And um, shout out to the Congress member Espayad, who was really instrumental in pulling this together. Also, mm -hmm. credit, credit to uh, New York Presbyterian for, for putting $10 million on the table. Um, as for the SBA loans, and, and Sade and others have mentioned that this is not a perfect solution, but uh, nonetheless, nonprofits are eligible to apply, and these loans will be forgiven assuming that, uh, that there's some continuity in payroll. That's a tall order, but certainly something you want to consider. Um, the way to apply for these is through local lenders, and there are some great community-based lenders who are serving as gateways into this funding the, through the Paycheck Protection Act, including Carver Savings Bank, uh, which is approved, and um, of course, my favorite community credit union uptown, Neighborhood Trust. Uh, also, uh, you can apply through them and some of the mainstream banks as well, like Bank of America. But of course, I'd love to see the community-based lenders stepping up for that. So um, reach out to them. Use my office, I'm sure, uh, the borough president's office as well, if you need help navigating through that, because it is a little bit complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually looking at whether we can have um some free legal assistance from cuny to uh provide orientation for uh, small business and nonprofits uptown in uh, navigating through the application process uh, i'll let you know if we can make that happen but we're talking to cuny uh the cuny legal service corps about that um and we'll, we'll keep you posted so uh that's going to be it for me but i i want you to know that i'm with you in this fight that i'm a resource in this fight that my office is here for you in a fight. We're here to take applications for city council funding, of course. And you know Amy Slattery, my budget director, is our point person on that. She's been on this call hearing your complaints. So reach out to us for the city council budget process and everything you need. Again, thank you, Madam Borough President, for your leadership on behalf of cultural organizations. And thanks to everyone for all you're doing in the midst of this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Levine. We have one question um, from yes. our, our listeners. Um, the fund that you mentioned that's available for Harlem, right. is that for all of Harlem? I'm sorry, I should have clarified. It is West Harlem. West Harlem. And Washington Heights and Inwood. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how they draw the lines. I know that the Congress member is now talking to Mount Sinai about doing a similar fund that's focused on East Harlem, possibly Central Harlem as well. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I should, have, I should have mentioned that the territory that the New York Presbyterian Hispanic Federation Fund is focused on is in fact West Harlem, Washington Heights, and Inwood. But I know many of you either are based there or do work there. And so I do uh, wanna make sure you know about it. Okay, thank you very much. You got it, thanks Donna. Yes. Be so, safe everybody. Okay. Thank you. So for our guest speakers, then this concludes with that portion of our call. I'd like to thank all of you for your passion, your insight, your skills, your resourcefulness, your collaborative spirit uh, to be able to continue to drive the arts forward um, under these circumstances. And of course, I'm looking forward to what happens after this, because we will have these systems in place uh, to continue to advance our work. So now, next, it's my pleasure to present Baraka Sele, independent arts consultant, who's going to share some of her perspectives on how to cut through the red tape and of sharing additional resources that we can take advantage of. Baraka? Can unmute your phone. No, Baraka's on the phone. Baraka, use star six to unmute your phone if you're just on the phone.
If you're dialing in with a 973 number, please continue to talk. You're currently unmuted. Well, perhaps while we um, get in touch with Baraka, we can go now to the Q&A section. Um, the Joyous Pierce of Harlem Arts Alliance is going to now moderate. Thank you, Joyous. Thanks, Donna. Um, we currently don't have any written questions that have been submitted, but I do see some hands raised. So first I'll go to um, Sade. Um, can we unmute her, please? Hi. Um, I don't know if the council member is still on. One of the things I forgot to say in my um, 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 remarks uh, is that I am the co-chair of the Coalitions of Theaters of Color with my colleague, Boza Rivers. And that is a very important uh, city council initiative um, that we have fought long and hard to bring to the city to create a safety net for theaters of color around all five boroughs. And so I would just also ask that um, as you go into budget season, if there are any more um, city council members still on this call, as you go into um, budget season, please know that some of that, that money um, are some of the only monies that these theaters get from um, our city and are a very important uh, initiative to keep alive. So I just wanted to plug coalitions of theaters of color. We've been hit very hard by COVID as many of us have, um, and many of us have less resources um, to be able to even apply for these loans or have access to information. And that is one initiative that has been very meaningful to so many theaters around the five boroughs of color. Thank you. Thank you, Chade. Uh, are there, is there anyone on the call who would like to address that before we move on to the next question? Okay, moving on. We have the next question from Lorcan. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, that says, uh, we are, uh -oh. yes. It is Senator Benjamin. I want to respond to Chade's point. Uh, we just finished our budget in Albany, but a number of us, myself, a couple of us, I had a ticket. And others, even though we're not in the city council, deal um, regularly with Speaker Johnson, the mayor. So I'm happy to take a list of what the top priorities of things that we want to make sure that the city council and the city is focused on and, and, um, and advocate for those things. So I'll just connect directly with Sade, but I'm happy to um, offer at least my services um, as senator to, to work, with, work with the city to try to fight for resources that our community needs, particularly our arts. Thank you, Senator Benjamin. Very appreciate it. And I will connect with you around that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do want to hear an update from Senator Benjamin in just a minute. We were taking a few community questions and then turning it over to the elected officials. And Assembly Member Inez Dickens is also trying to dial in. So please go ahead with the questions. Problem. Um, our next question is from Lorcan. Uh, Lorcan, are you on the call still? Hello? Uh, yes, I am. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to read your question. Thanks um, so much. No problem. It says, we are a 56-year-old commercial off-Broadway theater, presently hosting the Negro Ensemble Company, who we invited to perform here. Often, when we have no funding to pay for them to perform here at the moment, our greatest danger of survival comes from property tax. We hope that this crisis raises the issue of tax burden for Off-Broadway, a branch of theater here in danger of disappearing, not from lack of audience or importance, but from being from being taxes, taxed as if we are a high income business. Commercial theater is often a partner of the non for profit world and a resource to community in ways much faster and broader as when we as when we held a Patti Smith concert for the benefit of victims of the Second Avenue explosion. Um, and also, I think this is relevant, a question from Laura Caparati uh, in the same vein about rent forgiveness um, for a few months, um, worried about the risk of losing their theater. Thank you. That, that actually, the, the two, for those of us who own our theaters, um, property tax, and for those who rent, it's, it's very much the same question. So thank you so much. Not a problem. Is there anyone who'd like to address the, the question? 
Oops. Gail, we can hear you. Oh, wait, hold on. Now okay. you can go. All right. There you go. So thank you for those questions. I mean, the issue of property taxes is across the board. And the other challenge is that in the Midtown area, from Chambers to 96th Street across Manhattan, we have this horrible commercial rent tax. And uh, some groups, maybe not yours, also end up paying that on top of the property taxes. So I think, to be honest with you, it is very hard to get property taxes forgiven. There's also the issue of rent. And many of us are trying in the next uh, 90 days to 120 days, because there are different time periods that are at stake here, to try to figure out how between commercial and um, residential that not only do you not get evicted, but how in the world are you going to pay it? So I just think we all need to keep in touch. I must admit my number one issue is what I said at the very beginning. For goodness sake, the city of New York should not be cutting the money that was afforded and promised. Now, as a for-profit, it's a different situation. But mm -hmm. I want to make that very, very clear for the nonprofits. And we'll be glad to work with the with the for-profit theaters as a whole, because I know you're in the same situation, particularly when you're small, between property taxes and funding. So all I can say is our office is we're you know, willing to work with you. So we might be able to work through some of the larger theaters and figuring out through that theater fund, which we sit on, um, which I know comes about because of the uh, air rights transfer issue, th figuring out if there's something that way to help some of the smaller theaters. So I think everything has to be on the table. Thank you. Um, Athena, do you want to take another question or should we? move to remarks from well actually Athena we have uh, two more of our speakers that are back available if we could go back to them that would be great okay so Melody Capote Caribbean Cultural Center please uh, share your, us with us your responses good afternoon and I'm sorry for the difficulty um, okay. I was on for a while and I got kicked off I just couldn't get back on can you hear me yes <clears throat> I was able to listen through most of the presentations and kind of to reiterate that everything that Anna Glass shared and Robin shared, we all know the way the closing of our doors are affecting our organization. Quickly for the um, Caribbean Cultural Center, we had just completed a 10 year strate strategic plan, the first three years of which we're in, we're in focused on increased um, hires and expanding staff. And the plan also was looking at how we were already in need of expansion of space and looking for um, either new venues or partnerships for new space. So that now kind of, we're putting a hold on that. Donna, you may remember that just prior, and I wanna say just prior, uh, the Friday before 9-11 happened, you assisted us in a major marketing campaign that the center did. Yes. And we did a mailing of about 20,000 pieces of a new marketing brochure, um, which just shot us out of the water because it was it was the Friday before 9-11. And we saw absolutely no return on that campaign. So mm -hmm. as we walk through what is now our strategic plan, and just recently in February, the rebrand, a launch of a rebrand for the center, we get kind of like deja vu thinking once again, well, how do we turn this? into not an opportunity but certainly not into a total loss and so as everyone else has shared the increased digital footprint the use of our archives how do we come more alive online um and how do we stand out right how do we in the midst of now everybody doing this as a way of being physical um, and surviving I can I go over the uh, <clears throat> uh you know uh, continue to do what we do and do well I think what's most important, and I have spent maybe, and I'm sure all of us have, the last two weeks on calls and meeting and zooming ourselves out um, a space is that there are a few things that I feel um, the role of our organizations, and particularly looking at the work that the center has done historically, is the advocacy and activism that our organizations mm -hmm. must implement. Mm -hmm. as part of not moving forward but in the conversations with my staff it's about how we move upward and so nudging 
uh, broader conversations among us in different pockets, right? Because we're talking about Harlem organizations and how that lives within the broader cultural arts organization. Really having conversations that speak to not only the now, but how we come out of this and how we're going to look when we come out of this. Mm -hmm. That there is no real conversation from our leadership, and I'm talking not only elected officials, community leaders, church leaders, traditional leaders, about how we're informing one another and our communities. Um, I'm very clear that the work that the center does is not art for art's sake, but has historically been about art and art of survival. So we're going to get through this. There's no doubt we're going to get through this. Absolutely. It's how we do it and mm -hmm. how we do it not only gracefully, but how we come out of this without once again feeling mm -hmm. like we've got this very huge burden on our back. Mm -hmm. And so when we have conversations, and I applaud the SBA loan program, the paycheck program, Mellon coming together, and all of these funders who have come together with the 75 million. But I will tell you, being a staff of six, this is not easy. We are not prepared to be with this kind of first come, first serve yeah. um, approach mm -hmm. to funding. Yep. And that's what this has done. Mm -hmm. I have been on daily calls of cultural organizations that more and more of our groups are becoming a part of, but it's almost, all, we're almost always the, um, what is the, the cart. You know, we always come in behind these conversations. I joined these conversations when already kind of rich and engaging things were happening in a community that we're a part of, and we're always all brought in as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And so my concern um, in, this, in this very critical time is as we're scrambling to do submissions that kind of initially don't have a, a, a deadline, or you were told to have a rolling deadline, but then within two weeks, you're hearing decisions have been made because the first ones that got in already got funded, is a concern. Mm -hmm. It's a real concern when you're, and, I, and, and when I say small, I mean, we're small, we're mid-sized, I guess it's all relative and it depends on budgets and what our staff look like. I mean, for the center, we're a staff of six doing the work of 20, mm -hmm. right? But I'm very clear, my staff is almost all women and mothers. So I'm doing all I can to not have to furlough. I'm mm -hmm. doing all I can to keep us, you know, uh, not, not just above water, to keep us moving upward. And mm -hmm. so uh, my challenge to all, uh, all the partners on this call is, um, you know, outside of being able to stay present and visible, however we do it, and right now, you know, talking about the digital space, is what else are we doing to mobilize and organize and converse with our membership and our artists um, and ourselves, one another, because we get on these conversations, but it always feels like it's survival mode for our individual organizations. How do we come, what do we learn from this? What do we learn from 9-11 and the situations we were back, we were in back in, in 2001? It's so, I, I have to, while I, I don't want this to be a conversation and, and, and I didn't want to kind of piggyback on what everyone is saying, because Robin said it, we're all preaching to the, to the choir, we're all going through it. Mm -hmm. So now what? Mm -hmm. So now what? And I'm hoping that, um, you know, if, if in fact I have Baraka on the line and comes behind me, this is for me the conversation we have to have because we're all having kind of the same conversation about how devastating this has been, you know, whether it's box office, donations, memberships, galas, ticket sales, but it's how do we come out of this? There's no conversation happening that speaks to how we strategize and come out of this stronger, not just come out of it, not just survive, but thrive. Thank you, Melody. I'm glad you were able to come back into the call. Um, Noel, can you help us? We want to make sure Baraka is on and we can hear her. Baraka? Baraka, if you are on the phone, uh, please do star six to unmute yourself. Hello? Yes. Hello. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, I think the same thing that happened with Melody happened with Baraka. Somehow my computer or, or Zoom kicked me off the call, but I'm glad I'm back on. 
Um, and, uh, you know, like everyone else, you know, you can't say enough thank you to Voza and Joyous and Donna and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. And I just want to say thank you to an unsung hero on this call, and that's Linda Walton, <laughs> who, who is always behind the scenes making things yes. happen. Agreed. Yes. So one of the things that I want to emphasize, as I do with all the people that I work with, clients, consultants, colleagues, is to remember our most important resource, especially among um, our people, is our people that the most important resource is how we treat each other, how we function. As I often say as a consultant, the success of our organizations is not just how we function, but how we're feeling. And I've been on many of these calls and I've been hearing everything in the past few weeks from melancholy to mournful, anxious, conflicted, overly concerned, pissed off, centered and serene, blessed and grateful. So I think it goes without saying that we should all be checking in with our staff and the people that we work with and our artists and our communities as we're doing today and having those conversations and helping having them help us think through these issues. Um, I would also uh, like to thank um, uh, Madam Borough President for starting us off with various resources. I know I'm reiterating, but she mentioned New York Community Trust, who I've worked for as a consultant, um, nonprofit finance fund, um, and the many people who are are working with them. I've also worked with them uh, with another client. I also would like to add in terms of resources, I've heard there's a number of resources resources in the, I'm not sure if it's Chronicle for Philanthropy or Journal for Philanthropy, but um, folks might want to look at that. I really, really want to emphasize what Anna Glass said. It's something I shared recently with a client, and that is reaching out to venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. um, these are right now, to me, the unsung heroes of both the business and the nonprofit world. Um, I actually sent to a client several weeks ago a list of African-American venture capitalists who are not only building businesses, both nonprofit and for-profit, but they are also giving money as donors. I think we should not go to them with hat in hand, but rather sit down and, as Anna Glass said, learn from them. Um, I think that's more important than sometimes asking for money, is learning mm -hmm. strategy. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I would add is what Melody just said. I can't speak enough about strategy, strategy, strategy. Um, oh, I see a note from here that Donna says we're running over time, so I'll try to stay in the time frame. Um, but I just want to mention a few things because I think strategy is critical. Because we are often invisible, um, I want to say that it's so important, and these are some lessons that I've also been garnering from some of the other calls I've been on. Don't be timid about reaching out to both past and current funders, be creative, transparent, articulate about your needs. And that's not also, that's not only, as we said, um, about loss of income, but also loss of staff. Be sure you're articulating the brain drain if it is happening in your organizations. I would also mention, um, Gail Brewer mentioned that some of those funds that have been set aside are for not just art, but for social services and education. Most of our organizations provide social service and education programs. So make sure that you're looking at those programs as well and finding funding for those endeavors. Um, one of the things that's happening at the Ford Foundation, I sent around an email this week, uh, which is how I ended up on this call. The Ford Foundation is talking about elimination of red tape to make some of their 
funds repurposed and more available. One of the strategies that I think we need to talk about is how do we not just repurpose funds from foundations for crisis moments, but how do we purpose, repurpose funds for the long term? Um, one of the things that you'll find on the Ford Foundation website is a link called Build. You need to go to that and look at that, and it talks about how artists and arts organizations can influence funder practice, how grantees are being put in the driver's seat, and how organizations can help um, funders refocus or their funding practices and initiatives. And that speaks to what I think uh, Melody was talking about. After this is all over, or not even after, while this is happening, we need to stand together and go to foundations. Darren Walker is very good at listening to both grant recipients and potential grantees about what do organizations really need and when do they need them. And I think the funding world is turning that page. And before the, as Melody said, before the page has turned, we need to be advocates for what it is we need and to be not last at the table, but first at the table. Mm -hmm. The last thing that I will say yeah. is this, um, and that is how we position ourselves is critical, critical, critical. We need to stop referring to ourselves as underserved, underrepresented, yeah. minority, yeah. Um, uh, non-white, underprivileged. Yes. This is what legitimizes us getting the scraps from the table. These terms and this thinking is what validates us getting, as a dance company said to me in uh, Minneapolis, we get pennies to be put in grant portfolios. Mm -hmm. Part of that is our fault. Part of that is not strategizing, not being advocates that stand together, but going to funders as lone wolves. And part of that is how we address ourselves and think of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's it, Donna. Wow. I'm so glad you were able to get on the call. Thank you, Baraka. Um, Athena, do you have more elected officials to speak? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have both um, the wonderful Senator Brian Benjamin on the line, as well as Assemblywoman Inez Dickens. Um, Senator and Inez Dickens, Assemblywoman, would you like to speak? Unmute yourself. If you're dialing in, you need to if, hit star six. If you're on the phone, star six. Athena, I'd like a second member to go first, Inez. Yes, yes go ahead. I I'm muted now, Athena. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, with all due respect, um, Assemblywoman, uh, Senator Bryan, is it okay that Assemblywoman go first? Yes, I want her to go first. Yes, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, everyone can hear me now? Yes. 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 Oh, good. It's taking me forever to get on. You have no idea. Uh -huh. um, but in so any case, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. Um, I do. I first want to thank um, Madam Borough President uh, Brewer and her phenomenal staff uh, for all the work that they put in, put not just during this challenging health time, but moving forward and in the past. Uh, the work. Uh, Linda's familiar. You know, you understand what's going on. Um, so does uh, Rosa. Um, Harlem Arts Alliance, I am, and the Coalition of the Theaters of Color, all of which I was privileged and m more than, than honored to support um, greatly when I served in the city council. These are challenging health times. And I know that uh, we've spoken about the New York uh, Community Trust. I wanted to ask the, the Madam Borough President, is, is there anything that can be changed or amend it even temporarily to allow for assistance for our opportunity zones. They, we've got them in, you know, that's in law. They, they constantly change it temporarily like they did 
for uh, the for the um, the Upper West Side, they brought the Opportunity Zone up to Harlem in order to uh, provide funding. Can something be done with that? And I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Good question. Most of them would help maybe some of the for-profit, but I'd have to see how much they help the nonprofit. I know that in terms of the empowerment zone, which you know better than I, Berta Roosevelt is on the phone. So maybe she could answer if there's any opportunities for revenue there. But let me find out exactly, because these opportunity zones haven't done much, as we know. Not at now. all, not at all. And it, what it, the only time it did help was it helped down uh, um, it helped downtown. And it, it was brought up, the line was brought up to Harlem, West Harlem. Yeah. And so instead of us getting any benefit at all, yeah. all the benefit went to downtown. And I'm very yeah. upset about that. So I want to see if that can be done because I, I argue and I support and we can stand all together to see that that is done. Good point. I'll follow up. All right. Thank you. Um, Madam Assemblywoman, is that it? Yes. Basically, okay. I'm trying to look for other funding revenues. Yes. Uh, the budget this year in Albany was not good. Um, it was not helpful to our cultural institutions statewide. Um, and we all know the other arguments that we can make. Um, but I am very concerned. Someone raised the issue about um, the, the uh, institutions that own their own uh, buildings or theaters, as well as those who are renting. And I, I absolutely concur um, because the, these bills are, these water bills and these real estate bills are about to hit on July 1st. And we have not addressed any assistance that will, will really help them. And we cannot send our institutions to the banks because the banks rely upon what contracts they're going to get and how much they're going to get if they're going to extend a line of credit. And that can be very damaging and hurtful to the institution rather than helpful. Thank you so much, Madam Assemblywoman. Uh, we have next uh, Senator Brian Benjamin. And then I know. Um, uh, Congressman Espiat's office is still on the line, and Aneri Batista would like to have a, a, a comment. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you to the borough president. I want to thank both the rivers and, and others who put this important call together. Uh, I, want to, I want to start off by concurring with Assembly Member Dickens. Our state budget this year was a draconian budget. Uh, the state is really in a bad fiscal, fiscal shape. There are a few... Um, um, Harlem-based nonprofits that we wanted that, to get new money to, and we were told, quite frankly, this year, no new money to new organizations. So it was a very tough time for us on that front. But I want to make two two points. One is, as I said earlier, um, uh, when when uh, the, the question came up from Sade or the comment from Sade, uh, number one, if there's any way that myself and the Senator Robert Dickens can help in terms of getting city revenue. I know for our president, you are going to be on top of this, but making sure it's your resources and we should all be fighting for this together to try to make sure that we have as little harm to our uh, nonprofit, uh, our nonprofits as possible. But then secondly, if there's any help that myself and Assembly Member Dickens can help if there, if there are landlords who, you know, are not being helpful as it, as it comes to your rent, we can call them and put the pressure on folks to try to help so at least with the rent, which is for a lot of people one of the biggest expenses. So I just offer myself to be helpful uh, to make sure that our nonprofits and um, uh, uh, our art institutions can survive this crisis. And, uh, you know, I don't want anyone to have to close their doors uh, and then it's impossible to restart back when we, when we get through uh, this COVID-19. And let's be clear, we have no idea we're going to get through this crisis. So we have to be thinking about this for the next three to six months? What are, what are, what are the survivability plans um, for the next three to six months, at least? And how could myself, Inez, uh, Perkins, Gail, Espayot, how can we all work together to make sure that um, our nonprofits um, uh, of, uh, of, of the arts are able to survive going forward? So I just want to say that, and obviously everyone has access to me, and I'll work with Gail and, and my colleagues to try to make sure that we do everything we can to ensure that every single one of you survives this crisis. Thank you so much, Senator. I want to just add something to that, Athena. I'm very sorry. 
Yeah, but I want to just add something to that. And that's, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Senator uh, Benjamin. Um, however, the, 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 and there was no new monies that we were allowed to put in. Um, and we would have to wait a few months. But I want us to understand that what plans we put in place today is going to have to help our institutions for the next two years. Because what is going on today is going to negatively impact all of us economically, our institution, and even our small owners, our small uh, uh, businesses, our, our culturals that are trying to survive. They have, the small culturals have a hard enough time to, to survive. And then we, oh, this, this COVID-19 is going to take us longer than six months. It's going to take us probably two years to recoup if we can at that point. Mm -hmm. And yes, the New York State revenue is down because business has been negatively impacted and shut down. And business is what pays for social services. I just wanted to add that in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam uh, Assemblywoman and Senator Brian Benjamin. Uh, I know you'll still be on with us um, to hear the additional comments. Aneri uh, Batiste uh, had a comment from Congressman Espiat's office. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Vice President, for organizing this call and everybody else who was part of uh, who's the host. So, at a call that we uh, hosted three weeks ago, the president of uh, New York Presbyterian donated to the Northern Manhattan area ten million dollars. Out of those ten million dollars, uh, right now two million are already available, and we were able to fight because they only wanted for the immediate Northern Manhattan area to include Hamilton Heights. Um, so everyone in Hamilton Heights can apply for the money. We went ahead and called Columbia University, spoke to the president who was willing to be helpful. He said he wanted to be helpful. And we mentioned the in-kind money is $21 million that was given in-kind money to West Harlem, to Coffee, who's on the line. Uh, out of those $21 million, less than a million has been dispersed because the money can only be used if you want to use one of their facilities, then you don't have to pay for it. So what we asked the president was to make that money available cash now. They informed us that Coffee right now will be getting $4 million for programmatic, like for example, you know, I believe is after school programs for programs that right now are not happening. So we will be asking Coffee if that money uh, could be made available for Harlem, for businesses that, and, and arts that are struggling. We also ask for five of those million dollars to also become cash immediately from Columbia to West Harlem and also to the Harlem Chamber of Commerce so they could help those businesses in Harlem that could get the that's money that becomes cash available. They can apply and they get the money right away. We need the help now. We don't need the help in five months, six months, or some of those loans that you apply now, but you don't you get the money in September. So whoever is here will ask you to please put the pressure on Columbia. You know, we're gonna advocate with us asking West Harlem to actually make the money available. Uh, because if right now you can invest on housing, but everybody else is dying. You know, we have over 100 organizations here, people that are part of the community that will benefit with $10,000, $25,000. If, you know, we could even create uh, an advisory committee. Uh, you decide who will that be. But if you can call, help us call on Columbia to make the money available cash now that's been sitting there for years, for almost a decade, and help us get the money uh, however, what, you know, whoever access you have to Columbia, whoever access you have to coffee. So the money that they're giving West Harlem right now, that is $4 million. If Columbia could give the money and say, yes, you could use it for small businesses. They're saying, and they will give, you know, they, they, they're claiming that they waived the rent for this, they waived the rent for that. And that is great. But that doesn't help, that, that doesn't make them a good neighbor. So to thank me, you so much. Thank you so much, Aneri. I just want to um, honor the time, and we appreciate that additional contribution, um, and we will work together on that. Uh, we have on the line also a representative from um, Council Member Bill Perkins' office, Linda Wood Guy. Um, if you could unmute your phone. If, you, so if, if you're on the phone, it's star six.
okay? Um, until we are able to get Linda Wood Guy on the phone, I just want to uh, make sure that um, if, if there are any other elected representatives that they have the opportunity very briefly um, to be acknowledged, um, but also that I want to recognize that we do have the Arts and Culture Committee of Community Board 10 and Community Board 9 on the phone. Um, and in the chat room, we now have a question from Joanna Castro at NOMA. Joanna? Hi, hello everyone. Um, it's great to see many familiar faces and uh, many new faces as well. Um, I also want to um, give a shout out to Washington Heights and Inwood Arts Organizations that are on the line. Um, so if they have any questions or comments, um, to please add them in the chat. Um, so hopefully they'll be covered now or as we continue the conversation and, and hopefully a part two. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to recognize Melanie Farrar from Community Board not, uh, 11's Arts and Culture is also on the line. And this is Linda. Good afternoon. Uh, Linda, please go ahead and, and give your comment on behalf of Council Member Bill Perkins. I want to um, just echo everything that everyone has said about this being a different and concerning times. Um, I want to give um, my condolences out to the families I, um, of uh, Controller Scott Stringer as well. Um, as to our own family, um, uh, uh, um, the councilman's Mrs. Um, Pam Perkins, um, and to everyone in the arts and the Harlem team, Harlem community. Um, it's, it's very hard to be optimistic and hearing this call um, and being a part of this call to hear such optimism from our creative arts community is encouraging. And I appreciate everyone um, who are striving and thriving to come out on top of all this better. We appreciate the webinars and the music and, and that the arts community has not forgotten Harlem and the legacy that you have done through the Renaissance to now. So on behalf of Councilman Perkins, I want to thank everyone as we continue to strive and thrive um, during this time. Thank you so much, Linda. We appreciate your uh, remarks on behalf of the council member. Um, I just want to give everyone an update in terms of time. Uh, we will continue the call for another um, five, no more than um, 10 minutes at most. Um, and we want to get the opportunity for final questions. Uh, so I'm going to uh, turn it back to my colleagues, um, Boza or Joyous, um, and certainly the borough president will um, have an opportunity at the end to also close out. Do you want to take other questions, Joyous and Boza? I believe we have time for maybe three more questions. Is that all right, Athena? Yes, thank you. Wonderful, okay. So the uh, next question is from Beatrice Bolden of Impact Repertory Theater. Um, and she's asking, um, are there any specific funding opportunities geared towards youth theater arts programs, um, such as Impact Repertory Theater um, that anyone can share? Um, is there anyone who can speak to that question for Beatrice? Same problem. We're going to have to apply for obviously the two philanthropic. We're Gail, can you start over again? I'm sorry. Sure. You're it's, okay. it's Gail Brewer again. There's no magic bullets. Obviously, if you are in the uh, Columbia area or you're in the West Harlem, Inwood, so on, you can apply for those. There are some Midtown um, possibilities. There's the philanthropic that we mentioned earlier. And I think we will be helping uh, volunteer lawyers the organization will be going up and all of their support mechanisms as well as others on the city's cultural affairs website tonight. You just have to apply for everything to get us through this. And then, you know, it's an amazing call that Boza and Athena and others put together concludes, I must admit, 
we do have to kind of follow up on how, I don't know how else to call this. I do come from the tech community. We've got to figure out what's the paywall, if there is such a thing, that all of Harlem Arts could benefit from. Because if we're going to be online, it's great to be free, but you got to make money. I'm all about how do we get revenue and how do we not lose revenue to the Harlem Arts groups. And so that's kind of also maybe a smaller group with Boza and Athena and others could think about that in the Harlem Arts Alliance and Northern Manhattan and all the amazing people, because it, even online, you know, uh, whether it's the Daily News, which is kicking me off because I haven't paid the dollar for the next uh, uh, group of Daily News articles I freaking have to pay for. I'm not supposed to use the word freaking, but I don't like, I don't, not a bad word. Um, that's what I'm saying. So you have the amazing content that the world wants. So the question is, as a smaller group, how can we, you know, make money off of it and figure out how to share it. I don't know. It occurs to me as I'm listening, yes, we have to do some free content, but the world should be paying for what you have to offer. And I think that might be a tiny, tiny bit of silver lining for us to think about. But in terms of your question about how to uh, get money immediately, the only ones I know are the ones that were offered. And I also, there may be, as uh, Inez and I talked about the Opportunity Zones, or just the, uh, the work that uh, Verdere is doing and others at the, at the Harlem, and Harlem uh, Enterprise Zone. Thank you, Yo. Thank you. Um, next, we have a comment from Ade Williams. Ade, are you muted or unmuted? Ade, are you there? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, two things. One is, uh, I don't know who's still on the phone politically. Uh, I have a feeling that those who are, I'm preaching to the choir. But uh, I think it's important for our political leaders when we're fighting for budget money to advocate for us in the fact that when we, as uh, arts organizations are holding events, it shouldn't be looked at as the money that's coming to us is charity and the money that's going to quote unquote businesses is a real investment. The reality is, and again, speaking to the choir, to many people on the phone, but for those who aren't, when we are holding events at our venues, we are employing hundreds of, of different people, whether they're musicians, stagehands, cleaners, ushers. Uh, promoters, producers, but more importantly, we're also bringing patrons to the area who then are utilizing the area's businesses, ranging from bars, restaurants, taxi drivers, hotels, stores, what have you. So my point is that the argument does not need to be made that they need to do something charitable for the arts and cultures organizations. The argument needs to be made that when they invest in us, that's it. they get an immediate return on the investment because we are bringing people to frequent those businesses. Uh, so that's, the, that's a, key, a key thing that I want the politicians to hear. And again, I know many who are on the phone at the moment or on the Zoom know that. The second thing is, I, uh, I think it's important that we look for different ways that we as arts and cultural organizations find ways to collaborate with each other. So yes, we're going to need to get the funding that we richly deserve for what we do, but we're also going to have to rely on each other in more creative ways to, so that when one succeeds, we're all succeeding. And we can, and I'd like to look at ways that perhaps Harlem Arts Alliance membership card can enable discounts or what have you so that rather than us competing against each other, it's looked at as a overall win. And when people come to the Apollo, the Apollo is sending them to Dance Theater of Harlem and to National Black Theater and et cetera, et cetera, so that we are recirculating those dollars in our community. Thank you, Ade. Much appreciated. Let's see. Um, I do want to acknowledge at this time that uh, there's a representative from Community Board 12 um, on the call, are you still on? Yes. Wonderful. Do you, would you like to share um, any comments? Um, the only comment I would make is that we are having our community board meeting 
um, via Zoom next Tuesday and would um, welcome anyone from Inwood, Washington Heights to join us. Um, if you could share that link in the chat, um, in the chat to everyone, so that way we could have access to it immediately. That would be awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, and then, Athena, we have one more comment, and I think we can wrap up. Um, yes, thank you. No mm -hmm. It's from Arden Sherman. Um, it says, Arden Sherman here, director and curator of Hunter East Harlem Gallery at Hunter College. Um, I agree with Melody Capote about the need for more action-oriented conversations. I believe the nonprofit arts community will be very changed after the COVID pan pandemic, and it feels important for like-minded institutions to think about collaborating on programming, on staff, on promotional tools, um, and resources, printing, deliveries, borrowing materials, et cetera. Since the future programming is now in question, let's think about working together to co-produce exhibitions. Let's think about co-producing performances, talks, public programs, and projects, et cetera. Power in numbers. We are more powerful approaching funders as three organizations rather than one. Email me if you want to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if my colleague Natalie Espino is still on the line. Or Karen Brown, I saw. Okay, or Gregory Hopkins was the last um, hand we saw raised, and then we'll turn it over to Voza Rivers and the borough president. Gregory Hopkins. I don't see Gregory uh, on anymore. Okay, um, then I'll, I will defer that last question to Melanie at Community Board 11. Can you I'm hear not me? Sure. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I put it here. So if you, if we could just rewind, if you could repeat the question for me, I was sending in the information for our economic development and culture meeting on Wednesday, April 8th. So I placed that in the chat box. Okay, that's all I was just acknowledging in case you wanted to um, report that. Um, I see no further questions. Um, I just saw a hand go by Karen Brown. Uh, Karen was waiting before. Um, this will be the last question. Hello. Uh, this is Karen Brown. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I am the artistic director for the Negro Ensemble Company. And first of all, I just want to say thank you, all of you, for allowing us to be a part of, of this conversation. Because as you probably know, we are not in Harlem, but our our reach, our primary target audience, our community is Harlem and all of those African-American and communities of color. So um, we, um, I appreciate all of, the, um, all of the information and all of the assistance and you, you'll be hearing from me again. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Voza and Madam Borough President, will you please uh, give your closing remarks? Uh, unmute yourself. I just like to uh, thank all of the participants who are in attendance on this call. A special uh, kudos to all of the panelists. You guys were really excellent. It really calls again for us to mobilize. Um, you know, I appreciate <clears throat> Sade because she and I had the pleasure of just being together a little over a week ago and talking about the seriousness of the situation that we're in. In light of where we are today, it doesn't mean that we cannot mobilize and advocate and present ourselves in a way that captures the attention in a meaningful way of elected officials and funders to know that we're serious about being here We've been here before and we'll continue to be here and continue to do the work that we do as a collective. Uh, I want to say again, Amita Hina, thank you. Linda Walton, Joyce Pierce, uh, Donna Walker, Robin Bell Stevens, again, thank all of you guys for making 
by this afternoon special. Madam Board. Thank you very much, Rosa Rivers. You're our hero and you're the one that initiated all of this and I, nobody can thank you enough. And the same thing for Athena Moore and all the amazing speakers. Um, I, I think we have you know, some marching orders we have to make sure that the city of New York, A, honors the grants that were promised for 2020, and also um, puts up on his website how in the world we can uh, navigate the federal funding. That's just one small piece, but it's a big one. I, you know, you are, as we said earlier, the economic engine for the city of New York. Uh, that is the economic, it's the arts, and the Harlem arts in particular. And as Ada said, that you are not, charity you are economic development and people should understand that and give funding as such and i think something about strategy with some of the vcs who are harlem based and african-american might help in that uh understanding for the recovery plan um, i know there are other issues unemployment benefits uh for individuals that we have hundreds and hundreds of calls but all i can say is keep trying um, and we'll work on the the tax issue and ways in which we can be supported for the profit and the for-profit either through the opportunity zones or just generally some of those tax issues that were brought up um you know i want to also say that on the just generally funding issues quite a few were listed today and we will keep working on that it definitely need funding you can't do any of this without funding and you know it should be flexible i mean how are you going to recoup all the work you've done if in fact that funding is not flexible i heard that some funders are willing to do that but all of them should be willing to do that and just you know i and i am not the one that can figure out how to do these digital platforms in a new 22nd century way but it seems to me that you have the content and half of tech is content and the other half is figuring out how to make some money off of it and if i get one more request that i'm from china africa middle east wherever else people are with, I have masks to sell, then there are out there hustling in ways that we have not thought of. And it seems to me that we also can do the same and we have a whole lot better content than people who really don't have any of that content in place. They just pretend they do because I've listened to it for the last two weeks. So, um, you know, this economic recovery, once we get through this, horrific health crisis. And it is a crisis. We're all losing friends and family. Um, I can't tell you how many friends I've lost. It's a lot and you have also. So this is a very important phone call and I hope we can continue um, working with you on some of the, the finer points because we don't wanna just be talking, we actually wanna help. And I know all my colleagues in elected office feel the same way. and you know your hero is really 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 Rosa Rivers thank you very much and thank you Noel oh Hidalgo for making yes. it possible thank you so much Noel for your expertise at Beta NYC yes thank you all right so with that said everyone have a blessed evening thank you very thank you. much thank you thank Bye -bye. you thank you Thank you. So Thank you. Much. Thank you. Stay safe, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day.